Welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Today is Monday, August 5th, 2019. Hope everybody had a great weekend. Let's get started over at thegrandsolarminimum.com where we'll start tonight's show. And we've got a lot to go over as well. Uh, lots of space weather, lots of real-time climate weather. Let's take a look at our solar wind speeds. At last glance, uh, solar wind speeds have been jumping back and forth between the 700s and 692.4 kilometers per second with a density of 1.4. KP indices remain at a 4 right now. We have been in storm conditions today, a minor G1 geomagnetic storm. Uh, and thus far, we have not had any major disruptions from that. But we have seen KP indices uh, over a long stretch of period of time today as well. Also, sun is blank, zero sunspots, that's 13 days in a row, a total of 67% of 2019 without sunspots. And also, I want to talk about the TCI. Drops a little bit more. We were Last time we reported on Thursday, we were looking at 2.60 on the TCI. Now it's dropped slightly again to 2.57, not too much farther away from our record cold temperature back in February of 2009, about 0.52 away from the record cold. So we are approaching the bottom of this minimum, uh, and we are also seeing TCI temperatures uh, heading towards those record levels at this point. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of things here as well for space weather purposes. Let's go to the space weather section here, Grand Solar Minimum Channel. Take a look at our current planetary alignment and had a very interesting conversation over the weekend with Jeff Harmon. Uh, Jeff, uh, astrologer, and I know a lot of folks out there um, don't put a lot of faith into that type of stuff, but I can tell you one thing. Uh, in my process of prepping for the interview with Jeff yesterday, or Sunday, yeah, um, I came across a video from Adapt 2030, and it was made in 2017. And David was talking about astrology and was seeking help from other astrologers and help him with the correlation that he thought that he had made. And uh, these predictions that he had in this video were based on planetary alignment. His prediction in 2017 was that May of 2019 would be a spring to remember. And I don't think anybody could doubt that, first and foremost. We've seen tornadoes, floods, snow, you name it, everything in May. Volcanoes, earthquakes, flooding, crop failure, delayed planting, you name it, we've had it. It's been a spring to remember. Um, and also in that video, it's something to point out that there, this fall is also another time to watch for, volcan for volcanic and earthquake activity. So as we continue with this channel, um, I will be looking more into these planetary alignments and doing more research on it. David is not a climatologist. He'll be the first to tell you he's not a meteorologist. He doesn't predict weather. That's not his game. And the fact that he was correct in 2017 about not just spring of 2019, but he pinpointed a certain month. And I mean, let's think about it. Over 500 tornadoes in the month of May, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we had a tornado in Dayton, Ohio. All right, but that, that doesn't happen. And I, I also mentioned the interview, you know, I, you grow up in Dayton, Ohio, and you're, you're always told, hey, don't worry about tornadoes out here. We don't have that kind of location that is ripe for tornadoes. And so, and that's been the truth. I mean, I've lived there all my life until the last three years. Of course, I moved up to New York. And this year, May 2019, they have a tornado rip through uh, multiple parts of their suburbs and some areas of downtown Dayton. So again, very interesting uh, topic. Uh, the interview should be out here in the near future. And like I said, David Dubine uh, first looked to astrology uh, for some of his predictions and some of his correlations with Grand Solar Minimum. And there's just all kinds of things that we could really get into when it comes to these planetary alignments and the magnetic connections. So. Anyway, interesting stuff. We'll help to get that out here soon. 
Taking a look at our solar activity, geomagnetic activity, you can see where we are in storm conditions for several hours today. Uh, our latest update, we are dropping at the KP of four, which does not give us storm conditions. And let's take a look at the SDO motion. There's that monster of a coronal hole turning away from Earth. And we are now in the middle of that storm as we speak. And looking at the sun right now, we do not see any uh, areas of concern for any more coronal holes at this time or even sunspot activity um, at this time. Maybe a minor coronal hole just to the southern region of the equator of the sun on the eastern limb, but that is very minor. And I'll show you where I'm talking about here. We're not guessing. I'm thinking somewhere in this area there could be a development of a coronal hole. This right here should not affect us whatsoever. Uh, it might just barely uh, ping our magnetic field. But other than that, uh, we could be looking at some activity here in this region right here, in this region as well. Uh, but right now, nothing has been um, announced or identified that would tell us that we are dealing with any sunspot activity. We are 13 days in a row without sunspots. So we will continue to see, oh, there's that coronal hole, but I thought it was a little bit further south. So if you look at the what's coming over the eastern limb, Right now, the region that I was pointing to that could have a coronal hole, I'd say there's more of a chance of a sunspot activity more than a coronal hole. So we will continue to monitor that. No large coronal holes on the upcoming horizon, I should say. So all is quiet, just like it's been for much of July. And now here in August, and like I said, we might have a slight chance of a sunspot activity but that is well probably about another eight to ten days before that area makes it around to the eastern limb of our star let's take a look at our tsi readings for july 27th 2019 we come in at a 1360.71 again we've seen this fluctuation from 1360.85 all the way down to 1360.4 and we just continue to watch the numbers go up and down from that spot. All right, so let's walk back over here to the grandsolarminimum.com. Eruption at Sabin Kaya Volcano. Now here's another eruption, 31,000 feet. Aviation color code is red in Peru. Uh, they just raised it. Satellite imagery shows strong emissions clearly seen under the sky, under clear skies. The IGP issued ash alert after explosion dispersed ash towards the western sector of the volcano in the direction of the town of Huambo. The institute is advising residents to take preventative measures to avoid damage to health. Obviously, we're talking about breathing in these aerosols. It's not safe. Uh, more pictures, more imagery of what happened today in Peru. Actually, this was a couple, wait, no, this is August 5th. We do have a couple day old stories though, just to pass along. And here you can see the ash plume. 31,000 feet. Uh, not the kind that you need for major um, climate disruption, uh, obviously. Uh, this is more like a what? An, a, a three on the scale. So nothing terrible here, but Another volcano in this region that has a 30,000 plume or higher. And we've seen plenty of those over the past several months in this region, and it continues to happen. Um, jumping around a little bit here. I wanted to talk about Ilan, the volcano that once again, this is two days ago. Uh, this was from Saturday. 63,000 feet. High-level eruption of volcanic ash to 23, uh, 63,000 feet. This happened on August 3rd, 2019. Imagery acquired around 1015 UTC indicated another eruption which has punched through the troposphere and has become a stratospheric with volcano high ash of 63,000 feet. Ash is currently moving rapidly outwards, however. The mean weighted wind direction is northeasterly. So 
of 31,000 feet in Peru, and then you have the Ilwan with 63,000 feet. Now, there were some actual um, reports that we had a 25,000 foot ash plume and then a 50,000 foot ash plume. It says continuous ash emissions at 22,000 feet were uh, observed extending west from the summit on June 26th. High level eruption was first reported at 155 UTC volcanic ash rising to 42,000 feet before moving southwest. Aviation code was moved to red. Secondary plume was 26,000 feet at 230 UTC. And then satellite imagery indicated volcanic emission approximately 55,000 feet at 550 UTC. So this volcano is busy. And that was what I was going to report was we heard of multiple uh, explosions. 63,000, 55,000, 25,000 feet uh, from this particular volcano. Uh, Again, we'll keep our eyes on these. It seems to be happening more and more. This one's happened twice now since the late June of 63,000 feet or higher when we're talking about ash plumes. Remember, folks, that's only half of what we saw with Mount Tambora, which was over 122,000 feet on that ash plume. So still a strong volcano eruption, but as well, nothing. What's that? At 63,000, yes. So, and- well, the volume, I'm sure that is going to have an impact as well. And if this thing continues to blow, like I was getting ready to say, I mean, yeah, we probably will see a similar effect. What's really concerning, though, is the pictures that we're seeing here on spaceweather.com. This is DeSoto, Kansas. And this person here, you know, I photographed a large dome of peakish purple light. Strong crespular rays were also visible. Purple sunsets are a sign of high volcanic activity. Fine volcanic aerosols in the stratosphere scatter blue light, which when mixed with ordinary sunset red, produces a violet hue. But which volcano? The answer is probably the Arioke. A volcano in the Kuril Islands, which erupted with a sun force of June 22nd, 2019. You know, I'm not sure that how accurate this guess is. It is obviously their guess. Uh, I believe it's it's just a collection, like what Mario was trying to say a minute ago. How many times? before we start seeing global effects from these volcanoes that continue. Yeah, we're not seeing 120,000 foot ash plumes, but we have seen our share of 55,000 or higher ash plumes over the several past six to eight weeks. And the fact that we're seeing images like this in uh, DeSoto, Kansas, and then you know a similar image in Jan- uh, July of uh, 2019 in Germany, so, so far we've seen volcanic sunsets in Halifax, Nova Scotia, mountains of Germany, Joshua Tree, California, in Orange County, California. Purple isn't the only thing to look for, says atmospheric optics expert Les Cowerly. In addition, he advises sky watchers to be alert for a very bright yellow twilight arch, fine cloud structure in the arch seen through binoculars and a long diffuse rays and shadows. Uh, but more importantly is that in, in space weather, by no means, is they're not claiming to be experts on volcanic activity. But the fact that we're starting to see, the, now this is weak compared to what we have in Germany, no doubt. I'm not comparing the two as the same. But we're starting to see signs of this here in the U.S. And I'm curious to see how many more photographs we're going to get moving forward of these similar looking sunset sunsets and this has everything to do with volcanic uh, aerosols in the atmosphere and the particulates they may like i said we may not have that big eruption right just yet but obviously it is starting to spread and if that kind of a haze continues to build up in our atmosphere obviously that only means one thing cooler temperatures less sun less tsi 
absorbing into the surface and therefore keeping temperatures just a little cooler than normal. Not saying that it will block out all sunlight. We're going to be wearing mittens and scarves here in August, but uh, 2019 is definitely the year of change. As we continue to march into this grand solar minimum, we see conditions each year amplify a little bit more. And tenfold for sure in 2019 thus far. And it only has most of us worried here in Europe and the United States for what kind of winter we're going to see this year. All right, so let's move back into uh, watchers.news. Water reservoir is nearly full at 8,500 rescued as record-breaking rains hit Mumbai, India. Uh, very heavy monsoon rains here. The population of 18 and a half million since June 25th, leaving seven lakes and reservoirs supplying drinking water to the city almost full at its highest level since 2016. Officials said the supply can comfortably last up through September 2020 without any cuts. That's if we stopped all rain right now. That's a pretty good surplus. Despite the delayed onset monsoon, Mumbai recorded its highest rainfall for July since, uh, since 2014 with 49.3 inches. Most of it fell between July 1st and July 2nd. That's 14.7 inches in 24 hours, 8.6 inches in the 26th and 27th of July. The city received around 57.8 inches of rain in July of 2014. Uh, again, breaking it down, 2015, they got 14.1 uh, inches and then 36 inches of rain in 2016. 2017, it rose to, to um, 44.85 inches by 2018. So we are seeing this uptick in July rain since 2014, we peaked out at around 57 inches and started to drop a little bit. But now we are starting to see those July rain totals creep back up. Obviously, we ha that has a lot to do with cosmic ray inflection. Uh, right now, we are at a space age record levels amount of cosmic rays. So this makes total sense to me. And the July numbers continue to get higher and wait till next year. Let's go ahead and throw that 57 inches of rain out the window next year. I bet you possibly on, on just based on trends, we could be looking at this record being broke next year in Mumbai. From June 25th to Sunday, August 4th, it saw 94.2 inches of rain, which is more than its annual monsoon average of 91.2 inches. Now, this is for the season. There are still two more months until the monsoon season in Mumbai is officially over. Again, David DeBond was not lying when he said May of 2019 is going to be a spring to remember. And then also watch out for the fall of 2019. We already know we've got some pretty cold air that's possible for the United States and Europe for this upcoming winter. We have an idea that we're going to see what we saw last year, if not a little bit more snow. Who knows how it's going to fall? Is it going to stay consistently cold? Are we going to get cold batches and big blasts of snow in between? That I'm not predicting. However, just based on information that I've looked at and everything that we've seen here at this channel, it would not surprise me to see the snow mass in the northern hemisphere stay at the same levels or above what we saw this year in 2018 and 19. All right, moving right along here. Uh, tro severe tropical storm Francisco to hit Kyushu with violent winds and heavy rain in Japan. Let's go ahead and check this out. Thanks to, once again, watchers.news. Japanese weather officials are warning residents of Kyushu of a violent winds, high waves, mudslides, swelling rivers, and flooding in low-lying areas as severe tropical storm Francisco makes landfall and starts moving over Kyushu early on Tuesday, August 6th. 2019. Francisco is the eighth named storm, tropical cyclone of the 2019 Pacific typhoon season. They're expecting around 10 inches of rain in southern Kyushu and almost 8 inches in the northern Kyushu region, the Shikuyu region as well. And here is a motion satellite image of this storm. It looks pretty bad. 
but this is just a tropical storm. This is not a serious, from what we're seeing here so far, this is gonna be a rainmaker. That's because the system's moving pretty quickly. Um, 18 miles per hour. A gust of a, about 100 miles an hour with this storm. Uh, sustained winds of 70 miles. So this is a, a very weak uh, storm, hurricane, possibly Cat 1, if that. Uh, by 15 UTC, August 6th, Francisco Sin is expected to be well over Kyushu, about nine miles southeast of Saspo. Uh, giving us precise locations here at watchers.news. Again, we'll leave the link in the description. And Pacific Typhoon season's moving right along here, folks. We got a couple low pressure systems to watch here in the far uh, Pacific Ocean region. So. Uh, lots of action out there. Not so much out here in the States, which I'm okay with that, folks. we got plenty of time for cyclone or hurricane season here in the U.S. Gulf region. And also, two more earthquakes, or actually just the one we're going to talk about right here. Uh, I know there was a 7.4 near Indonesia not too long ago as well. And then we had a strong shallow earthquake at a magnitude of 6.2 hit near the east coast of Honshu, Fukushima, and that was at uh, 1023 UTC time on August 4th. The agency is reporting a depth of 31 miles. The USGS is reporting as a 6.3 with a depth of 23.9 miles. The EMSC is also saying 6.3 with a depth of 24.8 miles. Almost 3 million people living within 62 miles of this area and only 71,000 estimated have felt moderate shaking and three and a, uh, almost three and a half million felt light shaking of this particular earthquake no tsunami uh there were no injuries or deaths or any major infrastructure damage from this earthquake as well or as far as we could see all right guys stick around we'll be right back for our climate news section don't go anywhere do you like this show? Give us a thumbs up. Want to support us more? Share to your favorite social media platform. Buy a t-shirt or become a Patreon. All links are in the description below. 